Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to a new week of studies. As we return to our studies in the book of Daniel, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and his guidance so that we may more fully and correctly understand all that he is trying to help our minds understand. Shall we now ask for his guidance in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many ways in which you are looking to enlighten our minds. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing, showing and warning us of the time of your soon return. We pray now, Father, that your angels may attend us, that your spirit may enlighten our minds further, and that as we assemble together, that you will show us that which we need for this time. Help us now, Father, direct us in all things, guide us so that we may become more able to give the warning message that you would want given at this time. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us now, Father, in all things. For this we ask, for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. If you could, Theodore, bring up that diagram again, and let's let's talk about this briefly. Okay. Stephen had posted in the WhatsApp chat the following diagram on Friday. We have all been aware that Rome was founded in 753 B.C. Here he notes that from 753 to 538, we have a period of 1,290 years, which provides an additional witness to the time from when paganism is taken away and papal room is wounded in 1798. But the rest of the structure becomes even more interesting because now we're looking at a period of 1,260 years from when Rome is founded to when paganism is taken away, which is very much in support of what Hiram Edson had been trying to present. So here we have witnesses to both the 1290 and 1260 as to its importance for us today. Now, do we have any other thoughts or comments upon this diagram? Well, it's pretty clear. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, we've done lots of this where we've seen that there's other spans of time that become the model for a later span of time in prophecy. Right. So we've seen things like this where there's 490 years, you know, for the the kings from from Saul's uh, being anointed in 1097 to Daniel being taken captive in 607 and then 70 years captivity following that. We've also seen where, you know, there's 490 years from the dedication of the first temple to the dedication of the second temple. And those become a model for the 70 weeks, which is 490 years. We saw, of course, the 1764 years from 34 AD to 1798. And then going back from that, to um, 1731 BC, 1764 years from 34 AD, to um, Jacob blessing his 12 sons, right? So the, you end up with this structure with all these 252s. We also saw the, the different 666 year periods. Um, so Miller had a period from you know 158 BC to 508, uh, so 666 year period which, of course, this would be a part of it. Now, of course, we we know that Miller didn't take into account the no zero year. So we could we could still still take that as there's the 1260 years is 666 plus 594. And and I've run into this 594 before. So it's kind of interesting. What did you say? What did you say? 594? Is that what you said? Well, it's just that, yeah, if you take 1260 and you subtract 666, because Miller had from 158 B.C. to 508, he had the period of 666 years. Right? Yeah. Okay. Right. And and then that's followed by the 1335. And 1335 is 666 times 2 plus 3 years. Right. Oh, I got you. Okay. So, so Stephen has done structures dealing with the, 1335 and the 666 years and how they they are interlinked as well. So this is just another little piece of that puzzle put in place. I thought it was rather interesting in that sense. Does this provide 
a second witness to the validity of the 1,290 years. Yes, definitely. So in this situation, is it possible that we will find a second witness for the 1,335 years? Well, what we already did. You're talking about the 1335? Yeah. Yeah, we already had that. We had that from um, the, the, the league that was made with um, um, the Gideonites. There was 1,335 years to uh, 158, right? Okay, but my, I, I do remember that point, but I'm asking, here we have this 1290 going from the founding of Rome that is specific regarding Rome. And then we have yeah. the 1290 going from the 508 to 1798. Will we see a secondary witness of this type involving the rest of this with God's people at 1844? So you want to have another one? Um, I'm, I'm just asking if it's possible. Well, you know, so, well, it is possible. We have it already is what I'm trying to say. Okay. It, because you have 1335 to 158, then you have 666 years, and then you have um, 1335 again. Okay. So just to show you this, yeah, so it's this one here. I can share the screen on this. Okay. So this, so this is part of this structure. I mean, obviously you could put the 1290 into this structure, but what you see here is you have Israelites lead with the Gibeonites, and there's three days in there as a symbol, and you can see the 1335 years to 158 BC, right? Okay. So, so that 1335 is 666 times two plus for three years, and right? so you can see that the 161 BC that. 158. Then you have 666 years. Then that's followed by 1835. So we already have that witness. I, I don't know that you would have another one within that 1290. Is that if probably that's what you're asking? You know, would we have another 45 years back from the founding of Rome or something like that? But but I don't think that that's how it works. Like in in this structure of prophetic chronology these different things interlock in different ways because they're different wheels within wheels. So this is really dealing with the 666 and the 1335 and its connection to 158. And then you can see, of course, the 158 years from 1843 to 2001, the 2001 years. We got these inclusive counts, but they all become part of this structure. So you can, again, you have that three years, 1840 to 1843, as part of that 1335. Okay. So another way that, you know, you look at this 1335 uh, is that it's, it's got this 666 times 2. And um, so you can take this, uh, how does that work? I don't remember how I did that. Anyway, it's not that important right now. That's just another mathematical breakdown. I can't remember how it works. Anyway, does that, that so? You, so does that help you answer your question, Dwight? It gives it gives a refresher as to how we're finding the second witnesses to these prophetic periods, because there are so many times that, as we are studying, there are those that come back to say, well, where is your second witness for? And how many times in the mm -hmm. past, especially in the in the historic view within the church and the movement, have we been looking for these second witnesses? Yeah, well, I mean, we didn't even look for the 1335. It just ha happened because we looked at the league with the Gibeonites and the league in 158, and then we saw it. But, but the thing that's interesting here, so this goes back to, you know, again, again a question that Felix had asked me regarding, you know, chronology. We spent some time together yesterday and, you know, we talked about it a bit more. So, you know, the question really has to be, well, what's the purpose of this chronology? Why is it important? And, you know, we agree that it's not, it's not necessarily for everyone. That is, God has given this chronology at this time for within this movement, right? Because it right. has been a witness 
to what has happened in the movement. And my argument right from the beginning is that the reason we had time in the movement as far as dates in the future and time setting was because Parminder had set that in motion. The Parminder had, had set in motion that time was now going to be a test for this movement. And he did that back in 2012 with his Sunday Law prediction for 2014. And then even though he was declared a fanatic by Jeff, he somehow, I'll use the word weaseled, his way back into Jeff's favor. And then in 2017, basically said, well, I was correct about that, you know, that um, 151 years from 1863 to 2014 and 126 years from 1888 to 2014. And that sort of opened up the door for him then to introduce in 2018 that we are going to set a date. So God has given us this chronology. And my work was a witness against what Parminder was doing. That is, the way that I had done chronology was quite different. The way that I, because I was just analyzing all of these these prophetic periods of the past, right? Wasn't looking for a date in the future. Wasn't seeking to, to time set. And but the fact that the date that he had set was given witness to by the 391 years and 15 days of Josiah Lich's prophecy and by the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, uh, uh, 390 years, which has a year and a half attached to it from the siege to the destruction of Jerusalem, and, and all of these other different periods and calendars and so forth gave witness to these dates. But really, it was it was really about a witness against Parminder's movement. That was that was the original purpose. That's the way that I saw it, especially as it unfolded. And then it continued to be a witness. These dates, you know, the study of judges and so forth, to guide us in sorting through what was happening within the movement, in the rejection of the foundation of this message by the American group and the Canadian group. So, so time is there, it's, it's a witness, but it's all based upon the past. And it shows that the past is connected to the future. And so there was this principle that Parminder actually introduced to me that I had a statement in the spirit of prophecy. And I, I never quote it word for word. For, I, I got to sit down and memorize it word for word. The basic idea is that when we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, that those events will reflect light back on past events in in Bible history. And those events then will shine light forward onto our path. And that is what we have experienced. So we can now see that, you know, this, this structure here, just this structure itself, brings us all the way to 2001, the 9-11. So it brings us to that history uh, that this movement really 9-11 in 2001 is is the beginning of the Sunday Law as a symbol. The Sunday Law began in 2001, and, and we are in that time. And this is this movement is the movement of 9-11, and 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 so we're just we just continue to to receive witness from God of of what's happening within the movement. But there is also the other aspect. And which I think is is becoming more prominent now as we continue to study these things, is the question of how do we present this to Seventh Day Adventists? How do we present this to others? And you know, I've had a strong conviction for a long time that this chronology is going to be used in an evangelistic way. That is not just to you know, to deal with Seventh-day Adventists, but also in reaching out to those uh, of other churches and those in the world. And and I have been working on, on putting together an evangelistic series based upon this biblical chronology. But, you know, it's it's a lot of work, and we're doing lots of things. And um, 
I don't think it's quite yet the time in which that's going to happen, but I think it, it, it won't be long until we will be able to put together a series of studies that present the truths of Seventh-day Adventism using this biblical chronology. So, and, and you can see how that would work. You know, you start with the creation of the world, you're introducing the Sabbath, at least the concept of it. You know, you deal with uh, each of these stories, and you can see that in, even in something like Ellen White's great controversy, obviously, <laughs> in, in a sense, doing that. But this would be with these diagrams and these lines, getting these different stories, connecting them together. So when you do get to the prophetic periods, you've already seen this structure. So, if, I mean, if you start presenting the 1335 as you're going through that history, you can see how it would unfold. I mean, I haven't organized it all yet, but you would see that, you know, you would present maybe the 1335 years to the league with Rome um, because you would be doing that when you're studying Daniel chapter 11. And then when you get to 1335, that's dealing with uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse, uh, you know, 11 and 12. And you would see then clearly, well, oh, you know, here's this 1335 years again. And, and so people would be more prepared to receive them because they would already see that these, these periods of time already existed. And, and so that's why I think it's just so powerful. So, so you can share your screen what you want to do now, Joy. Let's first consider the, uh, the comment from the chat. In the sense that chronology has sifted people, time is a test within this movement. Any comments on that? Yeah, so the reason why time was a test in this movement is we have not made time a test. Our minder made time a test, right? It, it, okay. it, you understand what I'm saying? So when they made that November 9th, 2019 prediction, they had claimed that this was going to be the close of probation for the priest, which they thought would be let him that is righteous be righteous still. But they, they in a sense, set this date, which now was going to test the movement. But it had to, but this structure came from that. So once they had done that, and I had given that, God had given it, but, you know, I presented the 391 and a half days from the 391 and a half years. And then we saw all of the things that pointed to Josiah Lich's prophecy, to Ezekiel, and that produced July 18, 2020, and December 25, 2021. And, and, and that's part of what I was doing in the uh, symbolic use of numbers, is showing that the reason why we ended up with these dates like July 18, 2020, and December 25, 2021, and the 777 structure wasn't because we were looking for any of that. It just came as a result of something. Once you set that wheel in motion, all of those things follow. And so... So time has been a test in this movement. And, and that, of course, then parallels what happened in the Millerite movement as far as, you know, time was involved. But you know, we've never sought to make time a test or to make any kind of test. And I don't think it's a test within Adventism in, in the context of what we have done. I don't think that all of these dates and everything that's happened internally in this movement is something that we present to Seventh-day Adventists and that you have to accept this chronology in order to be saved. I don't think that that's the purpose of it. I do think that there's a place for what we have done, and but as we move from this movement to, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and then to the world, the part that this, the chronology plays is going to be lessened, um, and it definitely will not be a test in and of itself as it has been within the movement. At least that's that's the way that I understand it. Okay. Now, where we left off on Thursday, we had come to verse 11, which had read, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, it's interesting for me when I'm looking at this, because the margin reading from the 1769 King James would have this read, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, 
and to set up the abomination that astonisheth, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Maketh desolate and astonishes, I think are two things that can aptly describe what has occurred within that time period. Now, scripture, of course, continues to blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. But go thou thy way until the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Now, we're dealing with an example here that from the time that the daily is taken away and the the abomination that makes desolate is set up. I believe the point that Hiram Edson was trying to make in the articles that he had begun was that the daily is one factor, the abomination that makes desolate is another, and that they're each receiving a 1,260-day time period. Is this something that, that Smith saw? No. So Smith, so he, he, he understands the daily in a sense, right? He understands its paganism, so he, he, he has followed Miller. Right, right. Now Miller, Miller himself, he applied the daily as we saw of Daniel chapter twelve, verse seven. He did apply a twelve hundred and sixty year period, but he did it in an odd way. He took out that forty five years and 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 appended it after uh, the abomination that make it desolate. And we saw that his argument really didn't make any sense. That to break up the twelve sixty. Uh, it would be like when people break up the 70 weeks and try to put, you know, seven years into the future or even take the, the first uh, seven weeks and put it earlier. Right? I've seen people break them up into so that there is not a continuous period of 490 years. So I don't think that that's consistent with Scripture to, to take a 1260, separate the 45 by 1260 years if you understand what I'm saying. So so he had his 2520 from the daily and the abomination that make it desolate with a period of, you know, 1,215 years, then 1,260, then 45 years, which, which, which really doesn't work. So anyway, the point is that Uriah Smith is not, he's not doing that. So he doesn't take that part of Miller's. And that's the other thing that's kind of interesting. So... They take some of what Miller has done, but some of it they just kind of ignore. Like, they never even address that. You're not going to see even people addressing um, Miller's 666 years, for instance. I don't find that they address that in the Advent Seventh-day Adventist time period. They definitely uh, don't address that. If you do have scholars addressing it later on, it's always just dis- dismissed, right? You know, Miller was wrong about 158, it's really 161, and so 666 years that he had for pagan Rome itself um, dominating God's people. We just we just ignore that. And some people will even say, you know, on the 1843 chart, it has 508, and, and they will argue, that, you know, that that's a mistake, right? Because they, they don't even accept the 1290, but so... Or the 158, the League of Rome, that's a mistake. And, and they'll say it's on the 1843 chart because you got 158 and you got 508. And so that really Miller's 666 years is on there. And, and there's no basis for that. So there was a lot of discussion back in 2013, in March of 2013, uh, regarding the 158 uh, date. And so that was in uh, future news. Um, in March, March future news uh, newsletter. Yeah, so Smith does not understand these things, and it weakens the foundation. So the first and second angels' messages are gradually being set aside, but unwittingly. That is, they they just don't realize what it is they have. They don't see the value. In, in examining what Miller had done and retaining 
certain aspects of it. And so we see with higher medicine, you know, he tries to read, you know, give a new period for the 2520, and and yet it's not really taken seriously. I don't see any discussion in that time period regarding it. He doesn't finish his series of articles, and it's just it's just ignored. So you know, the 2520 is hidden, and so Smith can't see it. No one can see it. You know, Smith isn't isn't the one really setting it aside. It's not his action that's stopping them from understanding the 2520. It's just God is not having them see it. Um, they could see it, obviously, if their character was different and so forth and other things were happening because there's other problems that are causing them not to see it. But we in this time are able to see these things that Smith never saw. I mean, if they could have seen the other 1,290 years, if they could have seen uh, the other 1,335 years, uh, if they could have seen, you know, things in Ezra chapter 7 to 10, you know, the prophetic, uh, like the, the chiasms there that point to Pentecost, they could have seen Millerite history and seen, you know, Samuel Snow's letters and the part they play in that structure. Um, you know, if they could have seen those things, well, history would be different. But they didn't see them, we do because God has revealed them to us at a time in which it's needed. And it doesn't make us better people than them. It doesn't mean, you know, we're smarter or more clever or, or more holy or anything like that. It's just that God has chosen at, the, at this time, he's chosen at this time to reveal these things to us. They didn't, they didn't see the 2520 divided either in 1260, did they? I, I didn't quite hear you there. I don't know if other people are having trouble hearing you. Oh, they didn't see the 2520 divided, the two 1260s, did they? Well, well, Hiram Edson did, but nobody picked up on it. Nobody said the church didn't study what Hiram Edson stu you know, presented in, in 1856 and said, we need to consider this. I mean, they, they published it, but there's... There's no one, nobody taking it up and saying, yes, this is true, right? Well, yeah. And, and said, you know, Smith was an editor of the Review at that time, so he would have known about Hiram Edson's studies, we would assume, but he's going to publish, you know, after 1863. So in January 26, 1864, he's going to publish that article attributed to James White, rejecting Leviticus 26 as dealing with a period of 25, 20 years. And he, and he does a very poor job of it. I mean, the article is, is really a mess. Some of the types of arguments that, that Smith used, such as, well, there's four periods, so we would have to add them all together to get 10,800 years, which, you know, and, and as we see, that the four seven times are not consecutive in the sense of 25, 20 years. Uh, adding up to 10,080 10, years, I think, not 10,800, 10,080 years. Um, but we do see that there are four seven times, which is something Miller did not see. And we see that they're connected to periods of 70 years and 140 years. So there's so much light that could have been gleaned from a further study of Leviticus 26, but they didn't, you know, God didn't show it to them. That's all I would say. You know, it, it not because they were evil or anything like that. It's it's just that it wasn't the time yet. I mean, obviously the church had fallen away. It was Laodicean. We're still Laodicean, but God is giving us a message, and so this this is part of that message. This understanding of the chronology, the understanding of the prophetic periods. I've been finding it interesting. When we are considering these points, when you look at Smith's attitude regarding the seven times, how his, how the seed that he has planted here was picked up so willingly by Prescott. Prescott's expansion was picked up with great joy by Froome, who then shared this 
with Reed and Anderson, and the three of them presented themselves as Frida to produce questions on doctrine, and their entire attitude was supported so completely by Desmond Ford, and has now permeated the majority of the theologians that are within the Adventist church. Yeah, just, um, so, so when we think about this, um, this rejection of the first and second angels messages, and, and we talk about, you know, Jones and Wagner come along with the third angel's message of righteousness by faith, as we, we characterize it, which is really the third angel's message in verity. The reason why that message never had the power that it did was because of the rejection of the first and second angel's messages. So, I mean, it, it, it so there was a, an attitude. So part of the problem that, that we see here with Smith, so when he writes that paper in 1864, you know, the January 26th paper, it's what he's arguing against is he's not directly arguing against Miller's 2520. He's, he's not addressing what Miller taught. He's addressing applications of Leviticus 26 that were being uh, done at that time. So the age to come, uh, the precursor to um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, were reapplying time periods. So we know that people reapplied the 2300 days for a while, but then there came uh, sort of a, an end to where you could actually take the 2300 days and have a different starting point to, to come to, you know, like they had 1847 and um, so forth. But with the 2520, it was a little bit more malleable in the sense that they could just take different dates in Jewish history to start a 25, 20 year period. Now, we know the Jehovah's Witnesses ultimately used uh, Nebuchadnezzar's um, seven times in Daniel chapter four as, as their main basis, but they actually did first start with Leviticus 26 earlier on. Uh, they just eventually set that aside for some reason. So the, the point is that Uriah Smith is arguing against the 2520 because of its misuse in his in his time, but he could have done a much better job of arguing against its misuse by actually establishing its correct use. So by just sort of dismissing Leviticus 26 as having anything to do with time is pretty obviously wrong because it's the basis for the 70 years captivity, uh, but also, uh, it's, it's part of the foundation of the message. It should have been evaluated and understood more thoroughly rather than set aside. And, and we can see then this, this idea of, of what, how Smith is working, his sort of uh, quasi-scholarship, wanting to be accepted within a more scholarly world, though you know, his scholarship is definitely nothing like the German scholars but it is like some of the Protestant scholars in the United States. So he's, he's working on that ground. And then we see Prescott and these others trying to establish a more credible, in quotation marks, footing for, for Adventism. All of these things undermine Adventism because it, it's starting with a false premise. You know, one is that we need to be a highly educated and intellectual well-trained scholars in order to interpret prophecy and that God couldn't have revealed to a farmer the prophetic periods because he, he wasn't he wasn't educated enough and yet you know God chooses who he chooses and it is true in some ways that Miller did not have the education but it wasn't really about education it's what God's revealed so God chooses an individual and he gives them that light, and he fits that person for that role, and all the education in the world isn't going to give you that understanding. Instead, the education of the world tends to unfit us uh, for receiving light from God, and so 
You know, this, this, this light has come from God. It hasn't come from any human intellect. Now, the points that Smith made that we covered on Thursday about this from verse 11, in one sentence, he states, from the reading of the text, some have inferred, though the inference is not a necessary one, that this period begins with the setting up of the abomination of desolation or the papal power in 538 and consequently extends to 1828. But while we find nothing in that year to mark their termination, we do find evidence in the margin that they begin before the setting up of the papal abomination. Dropping down, his, he continues to comment, counting back then 1290 years from 1798, we have the year 508, which has been shown that paganism was taken away 30 years before setting up of the papacy. So here again, Smith is looking at this very simplistically, but is using some of what Miller had taught, but not all. Yeah. So, you know, because if, if he had addressed the 666 years, which, which he's not, right? Right. With one, he would then have to acknowledge 158, but he's already rejected 158 for the League with the Jews. He has 161. Right. Correct. So, so you know, if he could have seen, which he couldn't, because it wasn't time to be revealed. I mean, he he could have seen the 1335 as well between the two leagues, Gibeonite League and the Jewish League. But because he's he's things that don't fit into his model or understanding, he just he doesn't thoroughly examine them. Right. He just sets them aside. And I find that that, you know, so what ended up happening with this movement is we went back to examine the foundation and found that it was it was laid correctly. He's, in a sense, finding fault with the foundation by ignoring certain aspects of it. But he's not doing it like openly. He's not saying he's never saying Miller is wrong here. He doesn't do that with Leviticus 26. He doesn't de- directly address what Miller taught. He doesn't address what Hiram Edson presented. And, and we see this actually through this history. People are rejecting foundational truths, but not recognizing that they're rejecting foundational truths. They just don't see them. And, and I find that fascinating. Well, the reason I brought up the names that I did, of course, Prescott in 1919 was very clear that he hoped to never again have to give a sermon dealing with the 2300 days. Froome, Reed, and Anderson in fostering upon the church and the world the abomination that is questions on doctrine revealed how much they clearly did not understand of what God was trying to do and how he was trying to lead. And then when you get to Desmond Ford, you get to a man that was just lost because he didn't wish to understand anything of the prophetic symbols. So here we have a progression coming from the seed that Smith had planted. So, we're examining this. We're taking it a step at a time. We're looking over every point that has so far come to light, and we're looking for additional light so that those rays may all be gathered together. So here again, Smith continues, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. Now, every time in the King James, we find a time period denoted in this manner, 1,305 and 30. Or when we go back up here, 1,290. Here we have a, a period expressed in a very straightforward manner. Here it's a little convoluted. And I usually find those that are the more convoluted are calling our attention to how this is a prophetic period. And verse 13, but thou, 
but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So here Smith writes, Still another prophetic period is here introduced, denoting 1,335 years. The testimony concerning this period, like that which pertains to the 1,290 years, is very meager. Well, it's only meager if you're willing to stop here. I think the, the, the charts, the diagrams that Brother Stephen has provided are showing how this is actually very rich and how we can show the chronological validation of how we are using these periods. Smith continues. Can we tell when they begin and end? Just, uh, just, a, just a comment here, Dwight. Sorry about sure. that. It was a bit slow on the trigger there. Um, so in the Hebrew, it doesn't actually read awkwardly. It says actually 1,330 and five days. Okay. I don't know why they put five and 30 in this order in the King James, because that's not the order in the Hebrew. So just, just noting that. Well, so they put 30 and five. Okay. It's great to know. Thank you. It's something that we need to pay attention with because we have been referring back to a lot of this in the Hebrew, but my main, my main focus is that I don't see that the testimony concerning this period or that of the 1290 is meager. Smith is questioning, can we tell when they begin and end? Here again, he wants to take a point and look backwards. The only clue we have to the solution of this question is the fact that they are spoken of in immediate connection with the 1290 years, which commenced as shown above in 508. From that point, there shall be, says the prophet, 1290 days. And the very next sentence read, blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335 days. From what point? From the same undoubtedly as that from which the 1290 date, namely 508. Unless they are to be reckoned from this point, it is impossible to locate them. And they must be accepted from the prophecy of Daniel when we apply it to the words of Christ, who so, whose readeth, I believe that should be whoso readeth, let him understand, Matthew twenty four fifteen. From this point, they would extend to 1843 for 1335, added to 508, make 1843. Commencing in the spring of the former year, they would end in the spring of the latter. Now, here Smith is, is correct, because this would be the spring of the Jewish year, 1843, which would take us into April of 1844, correct? Um, well, yeah. So when he says the former, he's referring to 508. Right. And the latter would then be 1843. Right. So it'd have to be the spring of 1843, not the spring of 1844. Right. So we had noted this the other day, um, which I didn't pick up on. Right. So, so he's saying that they would end in the spring of 1843. Because if it's true that you count 1335 years from 508 in the spring, that's the former year, then the latter year, 1843, is gonna be the spring. And we know that it doesn't end in the spring of 1843, it ends in the spring of 1844, right? That's the question I posed, so go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so he is not really correctly understanding this. So, and, and he's not really giving them, if, if that's the case, unless he's not really clearly thinking this through. So he's going to say, well, we're going to have the, the, the spring of 508 as starting the 1335. He doesn't really address what event is fulfilled in 1335. Now, it could be that he's, He's going to say, well, you know, Daniel stands in his lot at the end of the 1335, which you're going to see where he's going to address it. But but he thinks that's a mistake. 
So I'm not really sure what he's he's going to do. I haven't looked at this. I can't see the rest. But definitely he's not he's not attaching it to it uh, what happens in the spring of 1844. So he, so he leaves it kind of vague here, it seems. He leaves it very open-ended, doesn't he? Yeah, open-ended, vague. You know, it's he's not going to address, you know, what we would address, you know, that on April 19th, you know, Miller's predictions end. And then those that come to that period now are going to be able to, they're going to go through the tearing time. And if they continue to wait, God will reveal the second angel's message to them. You know, he doesn't address any of that from Millerite history. And the reason is that Millerite history, in a sense, is closed to them. The seven thunders has sealed up the experience of the Millerites. And it's only in our time that we come to, to really, you know, we don't even really address this in this movement until 2013, 2014, when we actually figure out that April 19th is the first day of the first month in 1844. We, you know, we we always were just teaching that it's it's March 21st, which wouldn't fit if October 22nd is the 10th day of the seventh month. Right. But it's just it's just you know who who really in Adventism, I mean, I'm sure that if you ask a thousand Seventh-day Adventists at random, you wouldn't find a single one that knows that the first day of the first month is April 19th in 1844. I mean, you might, if you ask a thousand Adventist scholars, you might found, find one, uh, damn seed. <laughs> um, but people just never think about it, right? We never used to think about it. We never used to think, well, it's the 10th day of the seventh month is October 22nd. What's, what's the first day of the first month, right? Just, it's just not something that's ever considered. And yet it's something that this movement understands quite well. At least it did. It's been set aside now. I don't think people think about it anymore, generally in the movement. Now, Smith asks, but how can it be that they have ended it may be asked, since at the end of these days, Daniel stands in his lot, which is his resurrection from the dead. This question is founded on a misapprehension in two aspects. First, that the days at the end of which Daniel stands in his lot are the 1335 days, which we think is a mistake. Secondly, that the standing of Daniel in his lot is his resurrection, which also cannot be shown. The only thing promised at the end of the 1335 days is a blessing upon those who wait and come to it, that is, those who are living at that time. What is this blessing? Looking at the year 1843, when these years expired, what do we behold? We see a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy in the great proclamation of the second coming of Christ. Forty-five years before this, the time of the end commenced. The book was unsealed and light began to increase. About the year 1843, there was a grand culmination of all the light that had been shed on prophetic subjects up to that time. The proclamation went forth in power. The new and stirring doctrine of the setting up of the kingdom of God shook the world. New life was imparted to the true disciples of Christ. The unbelieving were condemned. The churches were tested and a spirit of revival was awakened, which has no parallel in modern times. Is, is Smith correct on all points here? Yes, in a, in, a, in a very general sense. So what what he's saying here about 1843 is, well, the blessing is, is in, the, in the year 1843, right? So obviously the Adventist movement reaches its height in 1843. Right. Okay. I mean, they're gonna they're they're gonna be uh, attracting the world's attention with with their proclamation, but we definitely can't say that that's when the blessing is received. It would have to be received because this blessing has to do with the tearing time, the waiting and coming to it, right? And so that would have to be not just at the year 1843 when the prophetic periods end, right? And that's where he's going to say, 
First, that the days at the end in which Daniel stands in his lot are the 1335 days, which we think is a mistake. Secondly, the standing of Daniel in his lot is the resurrection, which can also, also cannot be shown. We would agree there. Uh, so it's just the blessing who comes upon those who wait and come to it. But those who are living in the year 1843, right? Now, he says when these years expired, but the He's just saying, well, the years expired. He's talking about the 1335 years. They expire in the spring of 1843 is what he's implying. And that's when the blessing is. So he's saying the blessing is that experience of God's people in 1843, right? Okay. In the proclamation of the first angel's message. But we take the position that the blessing is the proclamation of the second angel's message that comes to those who come to the end of Miller's period, which is the spring of 1844, and then receive the light of the midnight cry, right? Because those who come to April 19th and accept April 19th as the first day of the first month and then go through that tarrying time, those are the ones who are going to receive this blessing. This blessing is not referring to those who are proclaiming Christ in the year 1843. This blessing is going to come to those who experience the tarrying time and then receive the second angel's message. That's my understanding of it. All right. Smith, on the surface, in what he's writing here, seems to be in agreement with what is on the 1843 chart. Mm -hmm. However, is this in agreement, the way he has written this, with the 1850 chart? Um, so you're talking about the 1335, where they're going to have the 43 slash 44? Correct. Um, well, if you take in in a general sense that the Jewish year 1843 that he's talking about, if he's talking about the Jewish year 1843 that goes from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844, and he's including all of that, um, which he doesn't, which it's kind of vague, then you could say, well, yeah, he's in agreement with the chart if he understands it in that way. And, and just for those, like on the 1850 chart, they're going to have 43 slash 44, right, for these prophetic periods. And we know that this 1335 wasn't affected by the no zero year. So when they have it 4344 on the 1850 chart, that it's not because of that adjustment of the no zero year, right? Just to be clear on that. We should, we should probably bring up the 1850 chart and, and take a look at it so that people can see what we're talking about. Uh, so it's in the bottom right-hand corner of the 1850 chart. I don't know if you can readily bring that up. I don't know that I have a, a copy on this computer. Okay. Well, I might be able to do it. Um, if this chart opens properly. I can, that one didn't open. I, a lot of these charts, the files are not working properly. Ah, this is a good one. It's uh, called Explanation of the Time. So I'll just show, figure this out here. While you're, while you're figuring that out, comment from the chat. It's apparent that Uriah Smith did not consider Hebrews 11.4. They're referencing, they're referring to Abel, but could not be applied to Daniel, whose writings were to be unsealed centuries after his death. So he being dead yet speaketh. Thus, standing in his lot doesn't have to mean his, at his resurrection. Also, First Corinthians or Colossians 10.11 could apply. Hey, can you stop sharing your screen so I can share mine? Please, there, Dwight. You are. So when you look at this explanation of the time, prophetic year is a time is 360 days, denoting years, times, 7 times 360 equals 25, 20 years. Time times and a half, three and a half times 360 equals 1260. It started the um, screen share, but not showing it. Okay, it, it, it's just it a bit behind. Yeah. Uh, and then it talks about the treading down of Israel by the Gentiles commenced before Christ, 677. 
1843 years after Christ, added to 677, makes 25, 20 years. The length of the daily, uh, BC 457 to AD 508-9. So they're going to actually like 508-9. And then even the daily, uh, from the daily taken away to the papacy set up, 538-9. And then from the time of the papal and desolating abomination to 1798-9, 1260 years, and from 1798-9 to 1844. Now, you'll see there, I was kind of wrong there. They didn't go 1843-44. What they actually put there was 1843. And then they, you can see they, they whited it out and put 1844 in its place. Right. I don't know if they do that really well, because that's the uh, the 45 years. So you could see when they made the 1850 chart, they were still a little bit uncertain how to address, you know, what they would call the fullness of the year. So so when they're putting eight to nine, what they're doing is they're they're taking a Jewish year, right? Does that make sense to people? Like they're not saying that it's 508 or 509. They're just saying that we're counting that year as the Jewish year. So it's not so much about the no zero year, maybe. It's just that these are Jewish years. So 1798 to, but but the problem there is if you're going to have February 15th, 1798, that's not going to be in the Jewish year, um, 1798. Because the Jewish year to 1798 wouldn't start until the spring. Unless you're going to use the fall to fall year, so you could do that. But but you see the problem. They they were still quite uncertain when they made the 1850 chart what to do. And so so they have the 2300 years, the 1260, the 45 years added instead of 46 to get to 1844. So it's still they were still at that time working out exactly how to address that problem. And I don't think Adventism really ever did fully address. Um, the problem of the calendars, you know, at least, you know, in the general sense. Okay, so does that help a bit, looking at that? I think it's quite direct. How do the rest of you feel? Seems a little cleared up to me of the, what the nine is there, what nine means. Yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the problems there is it doesn't really address the 1335 directly, right? But it does, of course, give 508. And so it does give it there. It just, you know, doesn't mention 1335, but it does give 508. It does give the 45 years. So obviously 508, 1335 is in there. The situation that I think that we're looking at here with the church currently, their attitude seems to be, why wasn't something like this? addressed by Mrs. White. Why wasn't it made clear by her? And in so many cases, there were things that were occurring that either were not revealed to Mrs. White or she was told not to speak about them. Now here I, I'm, I'm quite direct about the situation that occurred where she and James saw the literal fulfillment of the curse that was upon that which rebuilt Jericho. It's just that for the whites that we came in a chiastic structure with the death of their mm-hmm. oldest, Henry, and the death of their youngest. Yeah, I, so first the youngest, then the oldest. Right. When when I've shared this with others that have been in the church most of their lives, they're absolutely incredulous about even the thought of this. And the comment becomes, well, why didn't Mrs. White tell us this? Well, there's a lot of things I think that Mrs. White has been told that she was told not to reveal. Now, now this is an important point here, um, because we know that there are lots of groups, peacekeepers, uh, um, you know, people who supposedly have new light, and uh, they just say, 
something similar to what you said, but not the same. Right. That is, they'll say, well, Ellen White didn't reveal it. You know, it wasn't the time um, because we have new light coming. And so, you know, so now that we, we that new light is going to be something like lunar Sabbaths or, or whatever it is. And we're not really saying that. What we're saying is that Ellen White doesn't, I wouldn't say that she's withholding information per se, because she gives us all of the pieces of the puzzle. You know, for instance, when it comes to the 2520, I mean, she could have made a more direct statement uh, regarding it, but she makes some pretty clear statements that the prophetic periods, you know, are from God. Right. And those prophetic periods are going to include the 2520 in the context in which she writes it. It's just that we wouldn't see that, right? Because we don't know about the 2520. So when we read about the last and longest prophetic period brought to you in the Bible, you know, as a typical fourth generation of Seventh-day Adventist, we're just going to see, oh, well, that's the 2200 days, right? You know, the 21260, she could have made an explicit statement, you know, that, uh, Daniel 12, verse 7 is referring to a period of 1,260 years for paganism. She doesn't, but she never does apply that verse to the 1,260 years for papalism, right, where she applies all the other ones. So there is a sense in which things are withheld, not because she's withholding them, but because they're not seen. If she was to reveal those things to us, then their purposes would be lost. And, and that wouldn't be the same as something where you have like lunar Sabbaths, which would be a direct con, uh, contradiction of Ellen White's plain statements about the seventh day Sabbath, right? Or if you're going to have uh, feast keeping as uh, there's plain statements in the spirit of prophecy where she addresses uh, the ceremonial law in, in a way that we, we would not we would not take her statements to support that feast keeping as something necessary for salvation right so lots of other things um, you know character of God all, all different types of things that people believe you would have to take plain statements of spirit of prophecy and say she's just wrong and of course that we don't ever do that with what we are saying we don't say Ellen White is just wrong if she didn't have the light on that, so she made a wrong statement. You, you, you see the difference. Right. What actually we find is that she she actually supports this, but it's just not seen. Like she supports the 2520, but it's just not seen because we don't know about the 2520, so we don't notice what her statements actually mean. But when you when you know about the 2520, it's pretty hard to take her statements to not be including the 2520, unless you're just extremely stubborn. So, so, so there is this difference that sometimes isn't really, um, really recognized. So people group us with all these other groups that have new light for the church, and yet, you know, there there, there is a major difference in how we deal with the spirit of prophecy. What we have seen is that new light never contradicts established truths. And many people's new light, I would say almost all of these, these errors, directly contradict established truths. Nothing about the 2520 that contradicts an established truth. In fact, it supports it. It makes old light shine even brighter. Right. Now, Smith continues... Was this the blessing? Listen to the Savior's words. Blessed are your eyes, said he to his disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Matthew 13, 16. Again, he told his followers that prophets and kings had desired to see the things that they saw and had not seen them. But blessed, he said to them, are the eyes which see the things ye see. Luke 10, 23 and 24. If a new and glorious truth was a blessing in the days of Christ to those who received it, why not equally so in A.D. 1843? It may be objected that those who engaged in this movement were disappointed in their expectations. 
so were the disciples of Christ at his first advent in a tenfold degree. They shouted before him as he rode into Jerusalem, expecting that he would then take the kingdom. But the only throne to which he then went was the cross and his royal palace, Joseph's new sepulcher. Nevertheless, they were blessed in receiving the truths that they had heard. It may be objected further that this was not a sufficient blessing to be marked by a prophetic period. Why not, since the period in which it was to occur, namely, the time of the end, is introduced by a prophetic period, since our Lord in verse 14 of his great prophecy in Matthew 24 makes a special announcement of this movement. And since it is still further set forth in Revelation 14, 6, and 7 under the symbol of an angel flying through mid-heaven with a special announcement of the everlasting gospel to the inhabitants of earth. Surely the Bible gives great prominence to this movement. We do not realize its blessedness and importance. Can the same that is applied here by Smith be applied to July 18th of 2020? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a couple of little points here. Um, okay. So, of course, he's, he's, he's applying this to the year 1843, so the proclamation of the message prior to the first disappointment, right? Right. So, so he's not he's not specifically like saying he's not grouping in here the the disappointment of October twenty second eighteen forty four. He he's really looking at the first disappointment. We would have to say, though in some ways he may be conflating it, right? Just like putting them together as as a disappointment. But we know specifically that this is referring to the first disappointment, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so it's it's blessed is he that cometh to the first disappointment to me is what um is being said. So those that endure through that, that proclamation of the message, they come to the first disappointment, they are actually receiving a blessing. It may not feel that way, um, but it is that way if they continue on, right? Right. So they have to go through that carrying time. Obviously, if they lose their faith, if they fail that test, they don't receive that blessing. I mean, that, that's sort of my main point, that this blessing is for those that endure. It, it's basically a blessing for the, the five wise virgins who are going to uh, receive the midnight cry, right? The bride goes out at midnight, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And, and that's the only way that I can understand it. Now, I, now I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so in this in this context. Um, so there is a real difference from Smith's idea of what the blessing was and our idea of what the blessing was. Uh, because we could say, blessed is he that carrieth, right, instead of waiteth, and cometh to the end of the 13 and 35 days which is the tearing time. That's when it begins. So we know that Samuel Snow in Boston on July 21st, you know, he asked the question about the tearing time. How long have we been in the tearing time? You know, you know, six months. How long till midnight? Three months. Well, it's midnight now, and I'm giving the midnight cry. Behold, bridegroom cometh on the 10th day of the seventh month. So to me, that's the blessing that's being referred to. It, it's it's not that 1843 is the blessing, but those that wait and cometh to that year have that opportunity to receive the blessing of the second angel's message and its proclamation and its empowerment. So so that difference is is it, it, it it's a stark difference really in interpreting the 1335. All right. Now, while we have very little left to cover in this portion, there's still more than what our time will allow. Are there any other thoughts or questions regarding what we have been addressing today? So, so um, well, just just this one uh, paragraph here where he's going to talk about Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Right. So that's going to be addressing, and this is where I guess we all look at, uh, tomorrow, but you know we have the proclamation of 
the first, second, and third angel's messages in Revelation 14. But he's going to be addressing here just the first angel's message proclamation. So he's putting the blessing with the first angel's message, and he's putting that in 1843. But we know that the first angel's message is proclaimed prior to that. Obviously, Ellen White sometimes has 1840 to 43. And it was interesting uh, in the unity group, Iran had made uh, a comment um, about great controversy 335.1, which is the topic of the 1533 days of the Millerites. So if you read uh, great controversy 335.1 backwards, it's 1533, right? Right. Uh, so men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. And we know it's August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844, that we have the 1,533 days. So we know that there's a connection between the symbol of the 1,533 days and the 1,335 days. Right? Correct. So, I mean, you could take Great Controversy, page 335.1, and you could say the first paragraph of Great Controversy 335, and you would have 1335, right? If you wrote just the paragraph number first before the page number, uh, we don't generally do that. But um, so, you know, so we have to recognize that this 1335 is connected to the 1533. And that means it includes the second angel's message proclamation, right? I would agree. If you go 1840 to 1844, that includes the proclamation of the second angel's message. So, so again, uh, Smith is missing out on a detail because of his failure to examine further, to receive further light from, you know, Millerite history, and. And in some ways, you know, he's trying to support what Miller taught, right? But he's taking the things he wants and the things that he doesn't want, he's discarding them instead of re-examining them and finding their proper place. And, and so what this movement has done in examining Millerite history is we've, we've gleaned the field and found all kinds of precious truths that had just been set aside. And that's what they're failing to do in this history. And that's why Adventism becomes stultified. It doesn't advance. It doesn't receive any new light. You know, the third angel's message is proclaimed by Jones and Wagner, but it's powerless because the first and second angel's messages have been rejected. And then the church wanders in the wilderness. And until our time, we don't even really examine uh, Millerite history. So all of these truths that, in Miller's casket that were scattered, all these jewels and coins and so forth, those are the things the dirtbrush man has come in to uncover and setting them in this new casket. And I would say that Jeff, at the present time, is ignoring um, all of that light that came to this movement and discarding it much in the way that, that Uriah Smith discarded light. We, we have to believe that God was leading us and that the light that we received was light. And if, if you deny the Lord's leading, if you deny the light behind you, then you have no light for your feet and you are going to fall off the path into the dark, wicked world below. Right. And, and that's the danger that, that's existing for, for Adventism, which I think has happened for many, but also for for Adventists who have been searching for truth, we have to go back to that light um, if we're going to have light for our feet. Okay. Is there anything else we need to address today? Let's hold on to this thought that Theodore just presented. We're going to have quite a bit to address tomorrow and then to set the tenor and tone for the balance of the week. Shall we now close with prayer? Father in heaven, evermore we see our great need of you. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction. 
Show us that which you would have us to understand. Help us as we go through the day today. Direct us, we ask, bless us, we pray, so that we may assemble again to learn more tomorrow. We thank you for this time that we've spent together. We thank you for the ability we've had to open your word. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.